today we meet a renowned Dutch artist and architect who both pushes and dissolves the boundaries between technology and art to create sustainable innovations that transform societies and lives. Join me as I explore the designs and the deeds of Dan Hoosgaard, a man who is not only an artist, but a change maker, a visionary, and an entrepreneur. In short, a true thought leader. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. I did want to ask you, in the beginning of your artistic journey, how much of that was taken from the tradition of the Dutch masters, where you grew up in? You come from the land of Rembrandt, Rubens, and Van Gogh. Tell us about how these influenced you, or did you break out on your own? A big part of the Netherlands is below sea level. So it's quite interesting to grow up in a country where actually without technology, without nature, and without the relationship between them, eh, with this creative thinking, we would literally drown. Uh, so I think that maybe explains the obsession with, with the Dutch light, the Dutch yes. guys, uh, which, which uh, we're quite known for. And at the same time, as, a, as an artist living in the now, I'm thinking of, okay, but what are my materials? What are my dreams? Yeah, I'm not using paint, yeah, I'm what's using your smart materials. Right? Yeah, exactly. yeah. And so it's interesting to relate to it, and at the same time, yeah, let's not restrain ourselves, but uh, use it as a tool to look ahead. Yeah. Well, tell us about your formative years. Uh, you took a degree in fine arts. What was your formative years like in the academe? Tell us about that and how you either developed a sense of your artistic vision or how you took it forward. Well, in, in the beginning, uh, um, there was a lot of experimentation eh, with different type of materials because when you, when you make something, it, it starts very abstract. Eh? It's like a taste in your mouth uh, of which you do not do know the ingredients. Mm -hmm. So you start to read, to write, to travel, to prototype, to make a mistake. And I think this is very important to, to train this sort of thinking um, from sculpture, from fine art. And, and I really felt at home, so to speak, when I studied uh, uh, Master in Architecture at the Berlag Institute in Rotterdam, where suddenly it was about context, about people, about creating habitats. And I, I, I really felt connected with that. Well, Dan, let's talk about tra that transition. Not everybody makes that transition from a degree in fine arts <laughs> into something, <laughs> well, design orientated, but also has the hard science of, 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 of architecture. Tell us about what made you shift towards architecture. Well, we, I, I love art. I love to, to explore ideas and dreams. And at the same time, I had a desire to, to create a context, an impact in a way. And architecture is, of course, per default, uh, a discipline which, which embraces that. Um, so yeah, maybe it was not the most common shift, but then again, I learned a lot, so it was good. Well, it's interesting, I, I remember Winston Churchill talking about uh, how we shape our buildings and they shape us. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. in, 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 in yeah. your way, how did that sensibility or that sense of vision come across when you left university and started a practice in terms of, of what you were doing? Yeah, because I think it was the same when I was a boy. I grew up in this hard concrete house and it was very like static, very robust, very, uh, a bit sober. So even when I was a boy, I always went outside to nature, building tree huts, playing with the animals and, 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 and uh, discovering things. And maybe when I grew up, in a way, the mentality remained the same. So during architecture, I realized I wanted to make things which felt more alive, more interactive, more open. And I realized that static materials weren't sufficient in that way. So I started to use technology, software, sensors. So Dan, in 2006, you formed studio, and pardon me if I butcher the name, Rolls Harder. Now, it's interesting you actually named it after yourself, but really the etymology of that last name is a rose garden, something that is harmonious, beautiful, and yet organic. Tell us about why you formed the studio and what did you intend to do? Well, I think it's very important to realize that a lot of systems that we based our economy, our, our identity on, are crashing uh, because they're not sustainable anymore, because they need, um, yeah, people, uh, desires have changed. And so it's very important to invest in new ideas, in new dreams, to be future-proof. And I think that's how I see myself. I make proposals. Uh, can you work on a dance floor which generates power when you dance on it? And so I'm the hippie with a business plan. It, you know, it's very simple. You have an idea, but at the same time, there's a desire to make it happen. And I think that that is 
incredibly necessary in a time like this and that makes today also a very exciting time. So, so, so there's a technological agenda, high tech, but there's also a social agenda to, to improve life. Yeah. Well, I'm interested to always see from an artist's point of view how you implement an inspiration and a vision into the actual work. So tell us about your first project, your first work. How did it come about? What did you learn from it, that, exp that creative experience and process? I think one of the first was June. Uh, and this was sort of thousands of little fibers and when you touch them or you walk by, they light up. Uh, small cricket sounds and we placed it in a pedestrian tunnel in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And that tunnel it was a bit scary, old, n not so super friendly. Cold infrastructure, right? Yeah, cold infrastructure, <laughs> a bit like no-go no, no area. And suddenly you had this sort of very immersive tactile experience and we just placed it there in the afternoon. So people on their way to work uh, who came back in the evening were like, <gasps> um, and it was very playful, very high-tech. And suddenly, you know, we had wedding couples going there to have their photo, had to have their photos taken. So um, um, people suddenly felt connected with their environment. And that's the first time I realized, ah, you know, that, that I, I, I like what's going on. I learned a lot as well from how people interact with it. Sometimes they did things that I could never imagine. Yes, exactly. And, and, and so it's, it's, it's yeah, I, I, that, that, that was the moment I'm like, okay, that's something's cooking. I want to learn. <laughs> I think that's very important to, to not consider yourself as a consumer, but as a maker. We make solutions, we make choices, and that has an impact on life. Let's talk about the move in 2011 to China and in Shanghai. Tell us about how different that environment was for you in terms of setting up shop, uh, the kind of milieu that was, the challenges of course of translating your art into a very challenging environment as well. Europe is great uh, to do research, uh, there's great university, there are great scientists which we, we've, we've worked with uh, for several projects. But I, came, I, I, I fell in love with China and it's sort of almost obsessive uh, 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 desire for the future, uh, like a refresh rate which is so high. Um, um, so I wanted to learn from that. And Shanghai was a sort of great gateway. The first two or three years I spent half in Shanghai, half in the Netherlands, and it was a great way to, to balance my brain, and, so to speak. And then you had the contrasting styles and also yeah. cities. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, also I got inspired. You know, I got inspired by Beijing smog. <laughs> This was maybe well, weird, one of you actually saw it as actually an opportunity to do something about it, right? Yeah, and, and that's how, you know, when, when you're a maker, um, I think that's very important to, to not consider yourself as a consumer, but as a maker. We make solutions, we make choices, and that has an impact on life. So don't, don't be too passive. I, I looked at the city around me, visited many, many times, hey, Beijing, Chengdu, Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen, and, and realized that the pollution became so bad. But on the other hand, it was a clear sign that innovation also had side effects, yes? This desire for progress. Yeah, yeah growth at the expense of what? Yeah, exactly. And of course, there's a government which is sort of taking charge yeah, and, 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 and taking measurements. But I want to operate within the now. And so, you know, it starts with a very maybe naive idea. And that was sort of the inspiration. Like, ah, oh, okay, but what if we would sort of build the largest smog vacuum cleaner in the world? Uh, uh, maybe not as a final solution for the whole city, but at least to create places, parks, which are 75% more clean than the rest of the city. And so it starts with looking, it starts with wondering, it starts with maybe frustrating, uh, being frustrated, and then sort of drag that into a proactive value. And I think that's really important. There's this famous quote of Marshall McLuhan. Uh, um, he once famously said, on spacecraft Earth, there are no passengers, we are all crew. Yes. And I thought that was very powerful. So, so you know, they're, they're, don't wait for government or corporations or your neighbor or your boss. Activate yourself. And that also creates a lot of freedom um, to, to do it the way you want. Also for business. Eh? Yes. Suddenly we are in a smog-free business. Part of you as an artist wants to transform things, but you're also transforming technology and the way it appeals and applies to people and the environment. Tell us about how it comes together. I think what I'm trying to do, or what I'm doing, is in a way always find a balance between the very pragmatism and the very poetry, and, and to meet the middle ground. In a way, the same as the Netherlands lives below sea level. Eh? So if we don't have that balance, we would literally drown. Um, 
I think it, it starts with a notion of, it's a Dutch word called schoonheid. And, and roughly translated, it means beauty, cleanness, clarity. Uh, uh, the same as I experienced the great Dutch skies every day when I was a boy. Mm -hmm. I got very sad that in big developing countries this was not possible anymore. Um, so I said, well, if Van Gogh has paint, maybe I have my smart particles. So that's how it starts. And it starts with a dream, but if it's a relevant dream, there's always high-tech companies, smart professors, universities, business connecting to it. And it helps me to create impact. So I like this balance, not just for the money, but to really improve life. You also transformed not just space and all these pockets of areas where you can transform things, but you've also transformed the process. Mm -hmm. You have, because of the, the nature of your art, you've been able to engage other people. Tell us about that yeah. experience of engaging people beyond uh, the work itself. Yeah. Tell us about that. No, it's definitely a, not a one-man show. You need to have a team of, of, of craftsmanship, of designers, of engineers, sometimes specialized scientists. Um, so, so I have the dream, I have the idea, uh, I, 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 make the t uh, I collect the team, so to speak. Um, you put in a room with a pizza hotline and say, okay, nobody leaves the room until we have something finished. And, and, and I love that. And, you know, the more radical the idea, the more freedom you generate in order to make it happen. You're dispelling that myth also with the fact that you're using tools available for you now that people can identify with as yeah, well. Yeah, very important. The role of art is... is is to question reality and to, to come up with new ideas and to connect people. And of course you, you, you hit science and of course then you connect with business and of course you, but it's not the final goal, but it's a great tool. Yeah. Well, what are these connecting with life, even the most prosaic aspects yeah. of it? I mean, Maybe. That's let's talk point. about your yeah. smart highway, about connecting, you know, a seemingly, seemingly mundane issue or, or modality is transport True. into something that changes your view of things and it changes the experience and makes it a little more lofty than the ordinary experience. Tell us about the smart highway. Well, my dream is, is uh, a world which is energy neutral which is energy harvesting, you know? Like, when you look at a firefly or a jellyfish, it emits its own light. It has no battery, it has no maintenance contract, it has no fossil or electric uh, energy needed. Uh, it's it's self-sustaining. Self self-sustainable, and, and it's just incredibly beautiful. So what can we learn from that? And looking at highways, it's interesting because when people talk about mobility and innovation, everyone always focuses on the car. But somehow the roads are disconnected from, from creative thinking, although they determine our landscape much, much more. Eh? You see the road when you're driving, not, mm -hmm. not the car you're in. So um, the idea came, can we sort of work on making it smarter, more interactive, more safe, more charging at daytime, glowing at night. And we teamed up with a large uh, infrastructure company, Heimans, where the CEO also realized that they had to invest in new ideas to, to survive, eh? because the existing business was under, under, under attack. And now sheikhs from Qatar start to call how much for 10 kilometers. <laughs> but of course, in the beginning, people are like, well, why, why are you designing highways? You know, is that, is that, but for me, it was landscape art. Yeah, that's where the people and are as well. That's good. Yeah. Hmm? No, no, that's also where the people are. You have to meet the people also where they are, and, and that's the experience yeah, that comes the, in. The public domain, exactly. you know, like that, that's where you want to tap into. I want to be surrounded by people who can do things much, much better than I could ever do. And that creates quality. And it's also the only way to improve life. So Dan, I wanted to pick up from what you said earlier about having your art being adopted by and appreciated by a growing audience. There is, seems to be a sense of uh, hesitation also there in terms of how you balance the role of an artist and an entrepreneur. Tell us how you manage to attain that balance and what do you advise other artists? Well, you have a great word for that, uh, to, uh, to balance things. And it starts with an N and ends with an O. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you have to say no many times to get a good yes. And, and, and what's the parameter? Well, is, 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 is intention. So I can be a decorator. Yeah? I can sort of like, oh, it looks nice, but it doesn't really change anything. Or I can question a status quo and reform something. And you, you have to look at it every time with fresh eyes, you know, because I don't want to be hidden in a white cube of a museum with a sign, please do not touch. 
but also I don't want to be the mascot of a big corporation. But there are a lot of shades of grey in between. And realizing that maybe the person you're working with have, has different goals, but somehow we meet in the middle without, you know, biting or eating each other. So the notion of co-creation is extremely difficult because there's ego and desire and all these unexpected emotions which pop up. But I want to be surrounded by people who can do things much, much better than I could ever do, I can ever do. And, and that creates quality. Uh, and it's also the only way to improve life. So the role of the entrepreneur, yeah, of the big corporation, and it can be Arcadis or Heimans or, or, or Shell, or, is really to invest in new ideas, team up with smaller companies who are radical, and I think that will create an impact on, on life, which, which, which is a good beginning of change. Well, that, it sounds more like an or organic way of approaching your know, life. There's a lot of struggle, there's a lot of resistance, there's a lot of failure, uh, it's something new. So you have to experiment. And then, and, and it also mirrors, I guess, your inner struggle as, as an artist to say, okay, what will work? What, what works with my sensibility? What yeah. fits with my identity yeah. as well? How do you yeah. go through that process from, from the inner workings of an artist to the actual tactile thing? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting because sometimes I make something which is a one-off and sometimes I think this idea is so important that I should on one hand sort of yeah, give it to this person and then he or she will mature it. Um, I think with Smart Highway and Smoke Free Project, it's, you know, I, I, it's my baby. I take care of it the first two or three years, but then it grows so big. And we are not, as a studio, not really good at that, in this upscaling, in this making it cheaper, making it easier to produce. So you need to find a partner who's like, okay, and now it's yours. Here you go, and we make some rules, and you stick to them, and otherwise... These I'm parameters, yeah, or, or that yeah, loses the, the, the essence of um, it. And that gives me another uh, freedom to think about new ideas, and it gives the other partner um, capacity for, for, for impact. Well, Dan, what is next then? You talk about the, the new ideas, I mean, having your, 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 these babies of yours evolve, but then you're always looking for the next thing while keeping grounded. Tell us about the next thing. Well, we're working now on a 32-kilometer dam project in the Netherlands. It's called the Afsluitdijk. This is a, a, a famous di sort of dike w infrastructure, water infrastructure, uh, which has been there since 1932, and it basically protects the Netherlands from, from drowning. But, okay, it needs to be renovated. Uh, to make it future-proof, uh, rising sea level. Um, so the Minister of Infrastructure commissioned us to uh, redesign it, also to really show the beauty of this fight against nature as an icon. So we're working on that, and that, that's incredibly complex to really make an experience you cannot download. Very subtle, but very powerful at the same time. Um, I'm working a lot with, with, with the light-emitting jellyfishes and fireflies. That, that's, I think, the biotechnology, the biomimicry Le taking principles from nature and sort of copy morphing it to the world you and I live in to make it more natural. I think this is very interesting. And for the rest, you know, let, let, let's see where it will take us. An artist draws inspiration from nature and even with the onset of technology, there is still this sensibility you have to draw from it because a lot of the wisdom comes from that. Absolutely. Is that, is that, is that the reason why you're really interested in preserving the environment so that it can teach us more? Oh yeah, man, there's so much hidden knowledge, but there is still a lot to be explored, really. And, and, and the time is now to do that. And it's not just out of ideology. It's also, I think, uh, the most yeah, profitable in a, in a, in a, in a hard capital way, yes. but also in a soft capital way for next generation. So that makes today, I think, extremely interesting. We are forced to be creative again. So. Yeah, it's a tremendous notion for me to know that as an artist, you're trying to put your art into something that is applicable and responsive to the times. So tell us about how you want to respond to this major trend that's happening right now, wherein cities are going to be the major magnet of people. By around 2030, you're expecting way over 50% yeah. of populations yeah, to be migrating yeah, towards cities. More. Tell us about how your art intends to respond to that and be able to uplift lives in the process. Well, I've always believed that we should use creative thinking and technology to make places which are good for people again. And with all due respect, these big cities are not. Um, so we should be smarter. And we should use all the ingredients we have in our brain, in our body, in our collaborative uh, thinking uh, to, to, to improve life. Certainly the thing that I've learned from this interview is, is, you know, bold and disruptive are the norm right now to get things done. And, and with an artist's sensibility, you've actually made it 
feel both inspirational and doable. So I wish you all the best, Dan. Thanks so much. To paraphrase another famous artist, the true voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Perhaps what a visionary and change maker like Dan Hurskard can tell us is how to change our mindsets so we can begin to tackle the challenges in front of us, whether it be personal, organizational, or with the entire country like the Philippines. I'm Quinta Pastrana. Join me again next week as we explore the minds and the moves of the countries and worlds most successful people. <laughs>